how much light do my house plants need? What kind of light do I even have in my house? Do I need a grow light? Is the windowsill light enough for my house plants? What even is bright indirect light? Am I a good plant parent? Why is this all so confusing? Believe me, plant friend, I've totally been there if any of these questions resonate with you and I have your back. Today's episode is bound to illuminate some answers to a lot of these questions for you. So welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Hello, plant friends. Welcome back to our repeat listeners. It means so much to me that you join me on a weekly basis on the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. And if you're new here, hi, I'm Maria, your new best plant friend the host of the show, a former plant killer turned happy plant lady. And the question of light when I was a plant killer, beginner plant parent, oh my gosh, it was so hard to understand. And we have multiple episodes on light on this podcast because you got to understand indoors, you got to understand outdoors, you got to understand grow lights. But today's episode is really set up to help us understand how to understand light principles in general and also capture some data about the light in our homes to pick the right plants for our house so that they can thrive and we can thrive alongside them. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks as per usual. The changing of the seasons is really hitting me this year, plant friends. I have realized that I need to do a massive houseplant audit. I'm going to do a full episode on this next month as the year end episode. But as you know, if you've been following the show, the last Spring into summer into fall has been pretty crazy for me. I got diagnosed with melanoma. My sister got married. I had so much work travel in September. And I have to say, my house plants have not gotten my priority as much as I wanted to because life has kind of gotten in the way. And I find that I'm looking around at some plants that aren't happy anymore and I'm realizing that they're not making me happy. So it's time to do an audit. It's time to go through my plant collection and see what is still bringing joy and what is not. And that's kind of on my docket this month. And I will talk about that more in detail next month. But anyway, I just want to encourage you to number one, not feel bad if you're looking around at your plants and you've got some struggling, some limping. I want to give you permission to compost them, gift them to someone else. If they're not bringing you joy anymore, you know, we get into this hobby because it's fun, not because it's stressful. And also, I want to encourage you in this change of seasons, this change of external surroundings, to use it as a chance to evaluate both your plant collection, like I said, but also your internal world. So ask yourself what plants are bringing me joy, and then also say what areas of my life are bringing me joy. Ask yourself what plants aren't bringing me joy anymore, which plants do I maybe need to get rid of, maybe need to compost. And then I bet there's some aspect in your life or person or issue or thought pattern that you could probably benefit from metaphorically composting as well. Plant life parallels. I'm chock full of them. Today, we have an old plant friend on the podcast, Daryl from Houseplant Journal. He was like episode three or four of the show when it launched way back when, seven years ago. Daryl, I like to say, is like the yin to my yang when it comes to approaching plant care. We're polar opposites when it comes to our brains and how we approach our passion for plants. However, we're both equally as curious and equally as enthusiastic about them. Daryl's an engineer, and his tagline is an engineer's approach to plant care. He loves science and stats and numbers, and he spent the last two years studying the science of light very deeply to come out with this light meter that he's launched, which we'll talk about. But he really is about assessing the environment and assessing his plants from a very scientific perspective. And if you've been following me on the show or on social media, you know that I'm just like a fairy... A little more ethereal, I guess, like a little fairy on a cloud, you know, watering her plants, much more emotionally attached to my plants. I come at it from a much more emotional place. So I love talking with Daryl because it's fun to talk to people who look at the world differently than you do. And Daryl has been a treasured friend of mine for a long time. So today's episode is all about light. It's all about light's purpose, why our plants need light, how to assess your light, 
we get into the nitty gritty because Daryl is an engineer. Bear with us. Hang in there. You're going to hear a couple of moments where Daryl and I always will kind of spar a little bit. So you'll hear that as well. I just love him. And stay tuned to the end of the episode where you can learn more about his amazing light meter, which I'm so excited to get my hands on. All right, let's grow some joy and grow some knowledge about lights. Daryl, welcome back to Growing Joy. Hey, Maria, it's good to good to be here. It's been a while since I've been on your podcast, but I'm really happy to be here. It's been a while. You're one of my OG plant friends. I think you were episode three or four of the podcast when it launched as Bloom and Grow Radio. And, you know, you and I have been overlapping circles in the plant space for a long time. When I just realized, I think it's been over a year since I've had you on the podcast, I just like hit myself because I was like, how could you let this much time go without talking to Daryl? How are you, friend? I'm doing very well. I've just been traveling as well, but not as much as uh, maybe in the previous years and uh, completed my second book, which we can talk about. Actually, we might as well introduce it right here. So my first book, The New Plant Parent, came out in 2019. The second book is called The New Plant Collector. And if you think about it, it's like if we don't collect plants just for decor, we collect plants because we love the plants, then we naturally we start getting into so-called rare plants or I think I think of it more as you just start collecting different genuses because you're interested in that particular genus and you can definitely have several different interests. So this is a book that speaks to that kind of, you know, collect them all Pokemon mentality. Gotta catch them all. Exactly. So because <laughs> so I found it to be like a really fun exercise in in figuring out, OK, you know, if you're a Hoya head, what kind of Hoyas do people like to collect? And if you're if you've never collected them before, maybe here's a little introduction on, you know, what you can go after, so to speak. Oh, my God, I love it. So it's basically different profiles of the different genera and then the species of like what you want to try. And yes, I have a whole plant parent personality on this, the curious collector. Mm -hmm. um, but you also want to invest. You want to invest more. That's when you're getting the grow lights and the humidifiers. I'll always remember I was talking to one of my listeners. Shout out to Jeff. If you if you still listen to the show, he had the most rare the most incredible plant collection I've ever seen. Hundreds of rare, tropical, healthy, gorgeous plants. I was in a UCLA class with him and his background was always amazing plants. And he had such an intense setup for his plants. He had hum multiple humidifiers in every room. They were all connected to timers so that he could, you know, manipulate the humidity for all of the different rooms that he had in all of his plants. It was so cool. But also, you know, he'd spent years cultivating his knowledge and his collection. And yeah, so shout out, Jeff. We love you. It sounds like this book is going to be the, the next perfect read for him. Well, you heard it here first on Growing Joy, <laughs> the new plant collector. Okay, I'm here for it. When can we start pre-ordering? When does it come out? So it's already on Amazon as a pre-order, but uh, it actually comes out March of 2024. Ooh, so exciting. So, okay. I realized that it's been a while since I did an episode on light. And like you and I know, the number one struggle, one of the two top two struggles, I think, for people, uh, especially beginner plant parents or those more advanced plant parents that now really want to get into how do I optimize my plant's growth? How do I optimize, you know, I just bought a $200 plant. How do I make sure <laughs> that this plant is going to thrive and not die? You realize really quickly that it has to do with light. And then you realize how confusing measuring light with your natural eye is and the importance of light for plants and kind of the differences with how plants see light and how humans see light and how you have to kind of learn how to differentiate that. So why don't we just start out with a baseline? Why is light important for plants? And what type of light is important to plants? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think analogies would be most helpful here because then we can have what's so-called like intuitive understanding. So I take my engineering mindset and I look at a plant and I think here is a little solar powered sugar factory. Love it. It's sitting there collecting photons on the leaves wherever it has chlorophyll. Any place that's green has chlorophyll. It's collecting photons. What are those photons doing? They're going into the chloroplasts and they're spinning little, mo like they're not actually motors, but you know, it's analogy to those photons hitting little motors and those motors churn out carbohydrates that are made from smashing carbon dioxide and water together to form little sugars. And in those little sugars, what does the plant do with those? It consumes it, metabolizes it to, to produce energy, to live. That's the same as you and I putting a piece of food in our mouth, chewing it up, 
swallowing it, digesting it, all of that becomes carbohydrates that we then go into use. So that means if you put a plant far from a window, what you are effectively doing is making its little engine very, very slow, like so slow that it's like painfully, like as if you skip breakfast and lunch for a few days, right? Just just imagine how you would feel. I don't know if you're putting it on a diet. You put yourself on a, 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 like a, a really restricted diet if you're sitting like really far from the window. And we'll talk about why I have a plant far from the window later. But the issue is you put a plant far from the window and its little photosynthesis engine is going really slow. So each day, it's as if it was skipping several meals a day. And eventually, it's just not going to sustain itself very well. And even though you go and diligently water it, whatever, it's just not producing its food for itself and just slowly dying. So it's emaciated. Exactly. That's the negative part of it. On the other hand, if you're somebody who has exceptionally large windows, you have skylights, maybe you even have a greenhouse, you put a plant in there and you feel as if the care is so effortless because you just have to remember to water it every week, right? But what's really happening is the light is what is helping the plant sustain itself and you are just providing the raw ingredients for that carbohydrate reaction to happen. So what I'm saying is the plant is doing the work with the light and feeding itself. You're just adding the the raw ingredients that it needs versus you put a plant far from the window. No matter how much we intend that the plant does well by watering it, by giving it fertilizer, maybe even putting a humidifier by it. But if it's in a spot that has poor light, it's just simply not feeding. It's, it's just not producing those carbohydrates. Yeah, I think. I feel like a big aha moment for me with light was understanding, you know, fertilizer is marketed as plant food. And technically, yeah, fertilizer is plant nutrients, but plants get their food, their sugars, their carbs from the light. So you can't put your plant in the back of your room and give it a bunch of fertilizer and think, oh, well, I'm feeding it. It's getting the nutrients it needs. The first food that plants need is light. And then you go into the micronutrients and the soil stuff. But I feel like that's a big like misnomer in the industry with how fertilizer is marketed. Exactly. And actually, then if we continue, because, you know, I'm going to keep, you know, I market myself as an engineer's approach to houseplants. So I'm going to continue here with the engineering mindset on a plant. And that is to say, okay, then if where does fertilizer fit into this equation of a little solar powered sugar factory? Well, The machinery itself, like the gears and the belt or whatever, the structure of the plant, those things are made up of macronutrients and micronutrients. So inside chlorophyll, we know that we have a nitrogen molecule and a whole bunch of stuff around it. Well, those things require NPK and micronutrients in order to be produced. But just the sustenance, like the everyday maintenance of just living, that's what light assists with providing, making those sugar molecules. So the sugar molecules is the fuel effectively, but the nutrients, NPK and micronutrients, they are the building blocks for the physical structures of the plant. Yeah, I love it. So I think what people get really confused about is bright indirect light versus high light versus low light. You know, you get it, you go to the garden center, you get the plant, the plant tax says bright indirect light. And I'll just blow, put myself on the spot for a minute. I thought bright indirect light to my eye was any place in my apartment that was illuminated. I was putting my houseplants like 15 feet from my window, thinking that they were in bright indirect light because when during the daytime, when the sun was coming in from the windows, like that area of my house was lit, but I didn't realize how far away from the window, like I didn't realize that I was putting them in low light circumstances. And I know that that happens a lot. So can you talk about the different types of light accessible without grow lights and how we can kind of gauge that with our eyes before we get into the science of measuring it. So I think I'm going to sort of maybe start with a funny analogy here that will illustrate why I believe that current descriptions of natural light for indoor plants are meaningless. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Okay, what what, what I mean by this is like, do you run at all? I actually don't run, but I'll just use this analogy anyway. If I tell people I'm training for a marathon and I ran the marathon, we know that the word marathon means specifically like about 42 kilometers. Is that that right? I don't see. I'm Mm -hmm. not a runner, but there's an actual specific physical distance correlated to if I say I'm going to run a marathon. 
versus if I just ran a long time or I, I'm just expressing a feeling and I say, oh, it felt like a marathon, then that doesn't really mean I ran 42 kilometers. It means I ran a long time and it just really winded me or something, right? Mm, okay. So what I'm saying to you is currently when people say bright and direct light, when they say high, medium or low, they are just giving a subjective impression of the light for whatever they might feel that it might be, which is to say, if you say bright and direct light for your pothos, let's say, if I go to my home and I put it where I think is quote unquote bright and direct light, there is no guarantee that that will even be the same DLI. I'm sorry, I've put it in the word DLI because I know we're going to talk about that later. Daily light integral, which is a measurement of how many photons of light your plant is actually getting. Right. Just for everyone. <laughs> just we'll get there soon, plant friends. Hang hang in there. <laughs> we'll get there soon. But like, I want to just start off the analogy now that it is a perfect analogy to say that total distance traveled can be thought of as the same as total number of photons received in a day, right? Because right, yeah, you have the speed at which you are running. You have the duration at which you ran at that speed. Multiply those together and you got your total distance. If you have PPFD or somewhat of an estimate foot candles and you multiply that with how long you receive at that rate, then you get DLI. The calculation is a bit more complicated, but it's the same idea. Yeah. So let me, because I'm a knucklehead when it comes to science, but I've spent a lot of time with these terms. So Daryl's talking about measuring light. So basically you're saying, Daryl, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying it's hard to measure light with your eye because it's all subjective. And also our eyes see light in a different way than plants do. Like we see brightness differently than plants see brightness. So you're saying that, you know, say you and I go to the garden center and we both purchase a pothos plant and I go home and you go home and I put it, I put that pothos plant on my table, you know, my coffee table, and you put that pothos plant on your desk. And, you know, we both perceive that as bright indirect light. The issue is, yes. And realistically, as long as, you know, there's some presence of light there and it's a pothos, which is a very hardy plant, the plant's probably going to thrive, but they're probably going to grow at different rates and they're receiving the different amounts of light. And the way that you can really calculate that is through these fancy words like DLI and PPFD, which we'll get into later. But basically you're saying, you know, it's really hard to capture what bright and direct light is because we don't have these calculators in our brain. <laughs> well, yes, but I would even reverse it and say that when people say bright and direct light, that is simply a catch-all term because measuring is just not a norm for light. And that is the reason why, okay, I have a saying. The saying is, there's no such thing as a green thumb. Those people just simply have the largest windows. Mm. But now, if okay, that's like, you know, a very anecdotal kind of way to put it. But let me now break it down. What I mean is people have different available DLI, meaning in their homes, but they're just completely unaware of what that number could be. And so instead, they need to chop it up to individual effort and magic to say why my Monstera is growing so much better than someone else, maybe who had the same Monstera for the same number of years, but theirs just doesn't look anything like it. Well, if we knew the DLI difference between those two people, I guarantee you that would account 100% for the dissatisfaction or satisfaction of a plant, how it grows. Can you believe it's time to start planning your 2024 garden already? What the heck? Where did the time go, plant friends? And if you need to plan your 2024 garden, you should be doing it with Territorial Seed Company. Start to build the excitement and anticipation of next year by planning what you are going to grow. And I highly suggest always growing something new. Every year, Territorial Seed Company trials thousands of varieties of plants in search of the best of the best to offer their customers. And this year is no different. Their 2024 offering is packed with dozens of new varieties and all of your old favorites. So you got to go on their website and check out all of their new offerings and the oldies and goodies. So obviously, I highly suggest you head on the website to grab your seeds to get first dibs on your seeds. But also, it's not too early to pre-order all of your veggie and fruit plants for spring shipment while the selection is at its best. 
and the good stuff sells out. So why not just get your orders in early with Territorial Seed Company and then spend the winter getting excited about what you ordered? And because you're a listener of Growing Joy with Plants, you get 10% off at Territorial Seed Company. All you got to do is visit TerritorialSeed.com slash Growing Joy and 10% off will be applied at checkout. Once again, that's TerritorialSeed.com slash Growing Joy. As far as I'm concerned, if you want success with houseplants, you have to have two things. Number one, the knowledge to care for them successfully, which is what we give you here on the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, and healthy plants. Because bringing a poorly grown plant home or a plant that is already suffering from pests or fungal diseases or issues makes that transition of bringing the plant inside so much harder. It is setting you and your plant up for failure. That's why I am so excited to introduce you to my new favorite houseplant grower, Proven Winners Leaf Joy. That is the plant brand you need to remember. Leaf Joy by Proven Winners. Proven Winners Leaf Joy is seriously setting the standard for houseplant cultivation plant friends. They're amazing. I just got back from visiting their greenhouses plant friends. I hope you saw on social media. It's the stuff of me in my pink jumpsuit. I was blown away. They are selecting the best plant genetics. They are growing them in a state-of-the-art, fancy-schmancy European greenhouse, which is like heaven on earth. It's filled with a sea of Monstera Thai constellation, philodendron, alocasia, pink plants, green plants, variegated plants. Whatever plants you have on your wish list, I seriously bet Leaf Joy already is growing or has on the docket to grow because they seem to have it all. They're amazing. Another thing about Proven Winners Leaf Joy that I love is, you know, I've purchased a lot of plants and I hate it when a plant doesn't have a plant tag or has a general plant tag. Their plant tags have the real scientific names on them, plant care guides. And if you're someone who struggles picking out the right plant for your environment, they've taken the guesswork out of it for you. They've made this cool color-coded collections line inspired by different areas of your home. The atrium collection is for highlight plants. The cocoon collection is for low-light plants. The work-life collection is for space-saving plants. And the spa scene collection is for those humid environments, for those lush bathrooms that we all pin on Pinterest all the time. So next time you're at your favorite garden center, look for these proven winners leaf joy plant tags. You will not be disappointed in the variety and quality you are going to find. Find plant joy in leaf joy. Head to provenwinners.com to find your local leaf joy dealer. And let me know which plant you take home on socials. Yeah. So you're also saying that saying you don't have a green thumb, it's your windows. Because if you have large windows and you're getting a lot of sunlight, you're getting more DLI, you're getting more available sunlight for your plants to photosynthesize with. So you're naturally just set up for success to be a quote unquote green thumb, which is a term I don't even like to use, but you're being set up for more success because you just naturally have more light available to you. And that's just the hard truth. If you have a bright space, it's going to be easier for plants to thrive than if you have a dark space. But it's also all about picking plants for the right space. So I remember, you know, because The other thing is I want to respect a lot of people listening to the show, one plants for emotional reasons or one plants for beautification reasons, and maybe they don't want to be measuring, be metering. And I remember you used to talk about how to kind of get a general sense of high light, low light from the plant seeing the sun. So for true beginners, can you just walk us through how can we like take a general glimpse of our light situation without a meter, without DLI, you know, speaking to the true beginner, and then we'll work our way up to our true advanced collector. Okay, sure. So let's start with, if I want to get plants, right, what am I looking for when I want to plant? I want it to grow nicely. I want it to look nice in my space. And I want to feel like when I when I care for it, I water, I fertilize, that it grows well. Like, that's my desire. Like, this is what I want as a first-time plant owner, right? So then what I will say to them is, you should put that plant as close to your biggest window as you possibly have. And your expectations need to be such that, number one, don't expect it to look the same forever. Number two, it will not grow the way that it looks like if it grew in a greenhouse, simply because you don't have the same DLI. but Even if they didn't know that, I can just say that, you know, don't expect it to grow like greenhouse. And number two, it will not grow as well as somebody who has bigger windows than you. Like it won't grow as quickly or as, you know, variegation won't be as vibrant as somebody with just larger windows. It's sort of like saying we need to align our expectations with how plants grow aligned to 
effectively the size of your window. If you're not going to use grow lights, if you're just using natural light, it's all about the size of your window. And that's sort of like how well the plant will grow is really based on how big your window is. That's the what I call the growth potential. And then you have to water, fertilize, and repot. Those are the things that you, we do to realize that potential. So for the total newbies, like, is there an easy differentiate between what is like bright direct light, like the direct light versus the indirect light? Is there any kind of tips you can give there? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I would say that when you're working indoors, you know, you're sitting in front of a window, you got to put your eyes basically where the plant is. So probably lower than your head height, right? So you put the plant right here and you look out the window. If the sun is right in your face, shining directly on you, you have a direct line of sight with the sun. We're going to call that direct light. And what's important to know about direct light is that plants can tolerate that directness for different durations. So meaning pothos or whatever, aglaonema, low light plants, they don't mind having direct sun on them as long as it's less than about two hours. If it's a cactus, you actually want it to be seeing the sun for as long as possible in an indoor space. At other times of the day when the sun moves away, then now we're dealing with indirect light, meaning if we're really just being like practical about what we mean by indirect light is just the ambient brightness that radiates from all parts of the sky and any buildings that might reflect the sun, right? So we don't have direct line of sight with the sun, but we have direct line of sight with a big patch of the sky. Now, the important thing with indirect light is how bright is it really is very much affected by how big your window is and how far away you are from the window. Because you don't have a light meter, but if you take a light meter and, or if you watch somebody like me with a light meter who walks away from their window, that number can start at, let's say, 400. Like, like we're talking about indirect light, so sun is away, but it's daytime. You put, the right, you put the light meter right at the window and it reads 400. If you move the light meter like an arm's length away, it could drop down to 200 or 400, meaning it could drop drastically. And yet, when our eyes look at a space, it all feels kind of the same. Like it's all, okay, it's daytime, right? That's all I can really tell with my eyes. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you for that clarification. You have brought up a couple of things. So I think that concept of direct light, you know, what Daryl just said, if, if the sun is shining directly on the plant's leaves, that's direct light. And depending on how long the plant gets to access that light is going to determine, is this a highlight plant like the cactus that wants to bathe in the sunshine for the entire day versus a fern that maybe could withstand direct light for an hour, but then those leaves are going to crisp up and burn. And then this is the big thing that you just said that now I want to dive into on the measuring thing, because what I realized when I started out with house plants, like I said, I was putting plants 15 feet from my window thinking it was bright indirect light when actually these poor plants were emaciated, right? They had no light. And that's because we perceive brightness differently than plants do. And it was only when for me, I downloaded, you know, back back in the day before the house plant journal light light meter was available. I downloaded a free app and I started playing around with understanding and I mean, the minute you step away from your window, the light availability for the plants to actually be able to make their sugar factory can dissipate and have, you know? So with your light meter, because you have done such extensive research, can you speak a little bit to how quickly that can drop from, it's like six inches, it's wild. It's like you think that you're still putting your plant in bright light, but if you're a foot from the window you're in bright indirect light territory already, you know? And then once you're in bright indirect light territory, it's kind of a sh total shit show. So can you kind of speak a little bit more to what you discovered once you got into measuring and how you got into measuring your light? Right. So I think the story of how I got into measuring is, is an interesting one, which has to do with this idea of green thumb, which we don't really, we, we don't really like using that term. I also didn't like that idea that there was just some magical special thing that somehow my plants grew very well. So the first light meter that I got, which was this very funny looking... So many toys. You have all the toys. <laughs> this light meter here, which is like very geeky looking, engineering looking, I walked around my house and just measured my light and realized, oh, back in that old house where I had two huge skylights, those plants grew very well because 
all day, if I was to put this meter there, all day, it's, you know, between 200 to 400 foot candles. Even if the sun doesn't actually shine directly on me, I'm always in the 200 to 400 range uh, for foot candles. And then when someone messages me and says, why is my plant doing so poorly? And I ask them, show me where you put the plant and it's 10 feet from the window. Well, I would measure my own sort of similar situation 10 feet from a window and see the number 50, right? 50 foot right. candles. Oof. Yeah. And 50, 50 foot candles is perfectly bright enough for you to read clearly, like as a human to read something on a page clearly. But 50 is four times less than 200, right? Mm -hmm. And when I see that number, I literally imagine that little sugar factory is like, you know, 200. Oh, spinning great, really happy. 50, it's like eh, chugging along really slow. Yeah. And it sort of puts a, like an emotion to looking at the number. Whereas if I didn't have the number, you would just never know. Yeah. So now let's go into some definitions because we're going to get a little yes. nerdy. So what are foot candles versus lux? Because I think as people dive into these meters, that those are the words that they're going to see. Right. So first we have to define lumen. Heard that term before too, lumen. And that is, it's calibrated to the brightness of one candle. It's like the light output from one candle. So think of lumen as, as output, meaning if you have a bulb, like a light bulb, they'll tell you, oh, it's 800 lumen, which is to say this bulb is as bright as roughly 800 candles stuck together into a bulb. But then there's foot candle and lux, which is a measurement from a distance from this lumen source. Okay, so one foot candle is the amount of light that's radiated onto a square foot, one foot away from one lumen. So foot candle is all one foot kind of dimensions, whereas one lux is everything for foot candles except one meter, meaning a okay. square meter, one meter away from one lumen. Okay, so it's capturing the amount of light in a certain space, a certain amount of space. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And when we measure light that's like, incident on a plant, it has to be in either foot candles or lux. It can't be in lumen because lumen is the output of light. Mm -hmm. Whereas foot candle and lux are receipt, like light received. Like availability to the plant. Right, right. Okay. Okay. So that's all old school, old timer kind of stuff, which I mean, I still use only because okay, we'll talk about that later too. <laughs> okay. Then, then there is the issue that the lumen is defined as like when we have the spectrum, because I have the thing right here, the different colors can be broken out into how strong each different color is within white light. Because white light is effectively just a mashup of all the colors of the rainbow, right? They're all mixed together. And so a spectrometer allows us to split up the strength, the relative strength of each different color. And so a lumen is defined as actually like a bell curve shape meaning we care a lot about green and yellows and we don't care as much about really strong red and really strong blue. That's the definition of, of lumen. Whereas we know from analyzing chlorophyll that plants absorb light from all the whole range, whereas humans, the way that it's defined, it's not that we humans actually can't see red. Well, of course we can see red, but it's just that our sense of brightness is mostly based on how strong the yellow and the greens are. That's just how lumen is defined. Whereas a plant, it photosynthesizes with anything between 400 to 700 nanometers, which is why that range of those photons are called PAR, photosynthetic active radiation. So any photon in that range is counted as, quote unquote, good for the plant. I haven't gotten into PPFD. So earlier I said foot candles and lux are sort of like old, older measures of brightness or of, of light received. PPFD is basically how much par light am I receiving? And the unit is specifically, okay, how many micromoles of photons per second per square meter, right? But the point is like conceptually, it's just now instead of foot candle being, I mostly care about green and yellow light. I don't care as much about red and, and blue. Now with par, PPFD, we care equally about all those photons. Anything between 400 to 700 we are going to count those photons. Okay, got it. Let's talk about this measurement now that we've kind of like laid the base for the measurement. 
Can we just talk a little bit about the difference between, you know, when these plants that we bring home, like the shock that they go through in terms of the lack of light? Because most of these plants are brought up in greenhouses. We both visited the uh, Leaf Joy greenhouses this year. They're so bright. There's so much light availability. And then they go into the plant shop and then they come home with us. And that's a big transition. Can you talk about the transition of going from the difference between outdoor light and indoor light and greenhouse light and home light? Sure. So it's like, let's imagine, because I've Mm -hmm. actually done this for real, is I have this light meter with me and I just stand there over top of these plants. And I just want to know, like, how bright is it for most of the day for you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Greenhouse Pothos? You were living in a greenhouse. Mm -hmm. You know, you got some shade cloth. It's not it's not transparent. It's, you know, shaded a little bit. I take my light meter and I and I measure it. It's going to be between 1,000 to 5,000 foot candles, right? Mm-hmm. On this meter. Imagine that that occurs for 10 to 12 hours. Like, you know, as long as the sun is up in the sky, then that plant is being, you know, diffused with the shade cloth and everything. You're getting between 1,000 to 5,000 if I ever, you know, measure on top of the pothos. Then... When you take it inside, again, you go to measure it. If you're standing right next to the window and it's a nice bright day, you have a huge window, you could be 400 to 800 foot candles. So that's like a fraction of 5,000. But if you put it far from the window, you might get 50 to 100. And again, that's another fraction of the amount of light. So just by measuring, we can now have like a proper, I guess, calibration for exactly how drastic that reduction is. Yeah. And I think it's just important to really understand, going back to our sugar factory analogy, no matter how bright your house is, you're putting your plant, your plant's going on a diet coming from greenhouse conditions to your house. So that's also why it's so important to get your plants as close to your window or under grow lights as possible to help them not, a lot of plants, if they're going to lose that amount of light, they're going to drop a lot of leaves or they're going to turn yellow. So I think that's another important thing that I felt like it took me a a minute to learn in my beginner plant parenthood. Fall is here, winter is coming, which always makes me want to do a little refresh, a little reset, get cozy, especially when it comes to my home. When it kind of feels like I'm prepping to hibernate up here in the woods of New York. Um, But cozy, luxe, home good items can be expensive. That's when I discovered that Quince, the company that I've been loving for their affordable and luxe clothing, also has well-priced home goods that elevate my home. So you've heard me talk about the gorgeous Mongolian cashmere sweater that I have been living in. It feels like I am wrapped in a cloud. But Quince also has the Mongolian cashmere throw blankets and pillow covers. Could you imagine a Mongolian cashmere throw blanket wrapped around you as you binge Gilmore Girls or whatever other show you watch in the winter? Plus, they have luxury quality home goods like their European linen and luxury organic sateen sheet sets. And like Quince's clothing, their home goods are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. You heard me right, 50 to 80% less. And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices along with premium fabrics and finishes. When I tell you I live in the biker shorts and cashmere sweater that I have from theirs, I mean, I, I wear them too often than I should admit. Give your home the refresh it deserves with Quince. Go to quince.com slash joy to get free shipping and 365 day returns on your next order. That's quince spelled Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash joy for free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash joy. feel like I am in a cloud right now, plant friends. Do you know why I feel like I'm in a cloud? It's because I am wrapped in the cozy embrace of a cashmere outfit from one of my new favorite clothing brands, Quince. I have been wanting to hit reset lately, plant friends, especially with my daily work from home attire. I went through my work from home in your pajamas era, and now I want to enter my work from home in your cute, cozy, comfortable outfits era. And this is when I found Quince because they are so fairly priced 
priced and the quality of their clothes and their home goods is insane. Like I said, I am wearing their Mongolian cashmere sweater right now and it feels like I am wrapped in the coziest cloud and they also make throw blankets with this Mongolian cashmere. Let me describe my outfit to you. I feel so comfortable and elegant at the same time. So I like I said, I'm wearing one of their Mongolian cashmere sweaters. Plant Friends, they're priced at $50. A cashmere sweater for $50. Oh my gosh, it is so comfortable. It is so breathable and it comes in so many colors. I'm wearing the burgundy one, but I also have my eye on their spicy mustard one and their Everglade green one because obviously I need to match my plants. I'm also rocking their ultra soft bike shorts. And let me tell you something about these shorts. They feel like butter. All Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. By partnering directly with top factories, Quince cuts out the cost of the middleman and passes the saving on to us. And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium fabrics and finishes. So give your closet and your home the refresh it deserves with Quince. Go to quince.com slash joy to get free shipping and 365 day returns on your next order. That's quince, Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash joy for free free shipping, and 365-day returns, quince.com slash joy. So, okay, let's go into, you know, level two. So we kind of talked to, you know, beginning ideas of light. Now, for those plant parents who have a good understanding of their light, they've had plants for a while, and they want to get their inner nerd on, their inner engineer, Daryl, houseplant journal nerd on. How would you suggest starting to explore measuring and what do you feel like is the most important measurement that they should focus on? Because you just threw out a lot, foot candles, PPFD, Lux, Lumen, blah, blah, blah. If I'm on my journey to start grasping these concepts better, what would be the first step that I would take in measuring? So I would say this, you explained something good here, which is like you you mentioned something good, which is that you've had plants for a while and they've grown pretty well for you, which means there always has been, quote unquote, pretty good light, but we've just never measured it. So we just don't know. And that is the aspect where I believe that if we start to talk about measuring light, then amongst the people who are who are very serious about the hobby, then our communications to each other about light will be much more meaningful. Because if I let's say perfect example is someone would ask me, oh, um, you know, my Hoya Carii, you know, the heart heart shaped Hoya. Oh, this guy tends to grow like really super slow. And then I'll tell them, oh, it was really slow for me in the first two years. But when I put it in my IKEA cabinet, really close to my grow light, measuring a thousand foot candles for 12 hours, like I set the timer for 12 hours, and it's a thousand foot candles, then I saw like rapid growth, meaning within a year, it like almost doubled in length in terms of the number of leaves and everything then I could tell that person, hey, these are my light parameters that allow the plant to grow much faster. So maybe you can try that too. Whereas like if it didn't have light parameters into the conversation, I would just tell them, oh, uh, more light. But that could mean anything. If they put a grow light too far away, it's and it's not even really making a difference or anything. It's like if we don't have parameters for light, then it's hard to give any meaning to more light, less light, too much light. Like it you know what I mean? It's like, we just don't have a proper calibration for that. And so that's why when we start to measure light, it's actually easiest to start talking about grow lights because with grow lights, you turn it on, it's the same brightness pretty much all the time when you leave it on. And you also keep it on for a controlled duration of time. Yeah. And just knowing those two things, you can get a sense you could at least ensure that your plant's getting enough light, even if you're not measuring. Well, no, no, but that, that's what I was going to say. It's like, because like, if I just tell you, I keep it one foot away, but then of course the light itself, unless I'm using the exact same bulb, I don't know if it's going to be 400, 800 or a thousand one foot away. The distance matters, of course, but of course, obviously the, the better thing to do would just be you set the distance and then you measure it. So like the example I gave, If I said to you, oh, increase the light for your Hoya Carii, and here are the parameters, 1,000 foot candles for 12 hours, then you, hoping to have the same growth for your Hoya Carii, you can put whatever grow light you have, doesn't matter what the brand is, 
you adjust the distance until you get a thousand at the leaf and you set your timer to 12 hours. Now we have some semblance of calibration that we can actually say that we gave it more light. Whereas most most people just say more light and you're still just left (laughs) in the dark to figure out what that means. Yeah, this reminds me of two different instances in my New York City apartment. Number one, I tried, I had um, a grow bar in my bookshelf that I wanted to start tomato seeds on. And I started the tomato seeds and I realized they were getting leggy. So I realized I had to, I had to prop the tomato seeds up right under the light because some people get the grow light and they think their problems are solved, but it's very much about how far you put a plant away from the grow light. Another amazing example was with my fiddly fig. Billy got me Figaro, my fiddle, my fiddly fig. It was a tiny tip cutting and it had tiny leaves, like maybe three, four inches. And It was fine in our Southern, you know, it was fine in our window, but it didn't really grow. And then I got the Soltec aspect light and I put Figaro under the Soltec aspect light and I tinkered with, I like looked at the directions and I tinkered with how far Figaro was supposed to be under the light. And Daryl, when I tell you the new leaves that were coming out of this plant were four times as big as the tiny leaves, like all of a sudden it was like, thank you, thank you for feeding me, you know? And now Figaro has epic fiddly fig leaves that you would think of. The thing is, when we go through this hobby, right, we're very focused on all the doing, meaning all the things that the people have to do for the plant, right? Watering, fertilizing, repotting. These are all actions a human takes. But giving light to a plant other than with a grow light, giving light is more like, okay, it just receives whatever light I have, right? But in fact, being precise about whatever light I have is sort of like this, what I think is the starting point to know whether or not such and such plant is going to grow satisfactorily, right? Because if you don't start with that, then you're left with only, oh, I yeah, just water once a week. Oh, I just you know fertilize yeah. with special fertilizer. Oh, I put a humidifier. And if I just do those things, most people expect that their plant will also look the same. But what I'm saying is, if you didn't start with the same light situation, then no matter what you do, it's not going to grow the same way. Yeah. I mean, I think empowering yourself with the knowledge to not rely on a care card, that's like the the philosophy of this podcast, right? So empowering yourself with that knowledge about actually being to measure. So to that point, you know, I know that you've spent thousands upon thousands of dollars on light meters because I think it's it's prohibitive. Light meters are prohibitively expensive. I remember... I wanted to get into measuring, but then I went online and all the good light meters were like $400 or $1,000. So what has your journey been with your own measuring light experience? And why did you want to create this new light meter that you have that is such a more affordable price point? It's interesting because as you mentioned, there's like lots of different price points for light meters. But I think we have to really remember what is the purpose for this light meter, right? And a lot of the very professional devices are more applicable when the application is super critical or has to do with direct like revenue. What I'm talking about is agriculture, meaning if you grow your plant better, you will get more money for selling whatever it is that you're growing. So in those applications, then you do need PPFD meters. You do need like something that will measure par for you. No, totally. And I think it's important that the most important thing I think you said was, I mean, you said a lot of important things, but, you know, light meters are not made for houseplant enthusiasts that are hobbyists that just want to get a better idea. They're made for these professional, you know, growers for your light meter. So what did you pair back and what did you keep for the houseplant people who who want to take that next step, don't want to, you know, spend a jillion dollars, but really want to understand. So how has your light meter been inspired and pared down from those crazy light meters? Right. So I would say the number one is that it uses the more, or sorry, I would say less sophisticated circuitry that would just be a standard photon meter, right? And one of the interesting things, remember I told you there's a little story about when I designed it, right? When when the manufacturer first came back and gave me this prototype, if I open up this meter here, like in front of the sensor here, before they just had like a raw sensor. And the problem is photons are not just visible photons. There's also infrared. There's also ultraviolet, right? And with plants, we try and care only about 
400 to 700, which is the definition of visible, right? But the problem with my prototype light meter is that it didn't have a filter in front of the light sensor, in front of the sensor, so that if I pointed a remote control, like my TV Mm -hmm. remote, and pressed it, the number would spike up really high. Why? Because a remote control uses infrared light. Infrared. Oh. And it was affecting the meter. So I was like, hey guys, you need to put an infrared and ultraviolet filter so that we only get 400 to 700 nanometers. It, we, we want the meter to respond only to 400 to 700 nanometer photons. So then I was able to source like a, like a little filter. It's, just, it's kind of like a purpley color filter that goes in front of the in front of the meter and then that way it would only respond if i was to shine like this this led light over it and not if i was to put my remote and press it so that was one i guess design consideration that i made sure that it still measured what is quote unquote basically par right the the 400 to 700 nanometers the other thing that i added which is not available on any other meter is like a, a temperature and humidity sensor. Oh, so like my hygrometer? Yeah. So it's basically your hygrometer with like temperature, humidity, but put into the meter. Cool. Amazing. So it's like a one-stop shop. <laughs> yeah. So you, you effectively, what I'm saying is you're, you're, you're taking a sample of your overall environment, all the conditions that are, that are in what are quote unquote environmental conditions, light, temperature, and humidity. That's why it's called LTH meter. LTH. Okay, got it. Yeah, that's so cool. I remember you're just bringing me back to the first time I got hygrometers, things that can measure humidity. I was walking all, I was putting them all over my house trying to figure out. And I think that's another pain point for plant parents is at least on my end, I didn't understand how dry my house is. My house is 18% humidity in the winter because I live in the woods in a log cabin. And I didn't know I was subjecting my sweet plants to that, you know? So I feel like once you get these toys, you go create, like, it is so fun to go around and get the hard data. I remember the first light meter I got, I bought a very fancy par meter. And I just remember like running around, not running around my house, but going around my house, putting the meter in different plants, you know, leaving it for the day to get the PPFD. And it was so fun. And it's, you know, when you're ready to take that next step, Getting some hard data for yourself is so fun and it builds your confidence so much because once you see the hard data, it kind of reminds me of, you know, when you talk about watering plants and, you know, the first time people are so nervous to water plants and then, you know, you say, well, when you water your plant, pick the pot up because then you're going to understand how heavy it is and then keep picking the pot up because the water is going to evaporate or get absorbed by the plant and then that pot is going to be light. And in a while, you're going to be able to pick the pot up and understand that it's time to water that plant without even feeling the soil. It's kind of similar. Like once you start taking these measurements in your house, you just get such a better knowledge of what real light is. And then it's like easier to see elsewhere. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think what you're saying too is also something that is called reverse engineering, which is that you have, you're a person who's owned plants for a while and they're very, you know, they're good. They're growing well. So Reverse engineering that would be, okay, seeing that this Hoya did well under this grow light, now if I measure it, now I can then tell somebody, hey, you see this Hoya that has grown really well? Like I said with my Hoya Caria, he hears what it, you know, here it grew very well. And now I can tell you parameters to help you perhaps replicate that growth degree, or it actually gives you license to then experiment to say, oh, I'm only willing to put it, you know, at a place where I get 400 foot candles and for 12 hours as well. Let's see if it can still do well. And that's the kind of the little bit of subjective matter, which I, I don't know if I talked about too much, but like with foliage houseplants, meaning like, you know, plants, we just grow mostly for, to enjoy the leaves. There is a very big subjective component to say that what internode spacing is considered leggy versus nice, right? That's a subjective matter. If you have a monstera albo, it's going to be a bit longer than, let's say, a you know large form deliciosa. But the point is, we don't really measure these things. We just kind of look at the overall plant and make a judgment. So that's where the subjectivity comes in a little bit. And that's why I say when we are more concrete with light, then we can understand that 
okay, look, if 200 foot candles for a Monstera produces really leggy growth, then I can say, well, I don't like the way that a Monstera grows with 200 foot candles for 12 hours. Maybe I should increase it to 400 by putting the grow light closer. Yeah. And so if someone gets your light meter, the LTH light meter, how would you suggest them starting their journey and getting more data? Actually, you don't even have to get my light meter because if you get any light meter that has foot candles or even PPFD, on my website, houseplantjournal.com, there is like a very big table that has all kinds of common houseplants and their kind of like light requirements. Now, again, back to the subjectivity thing, which is to realize you should use these as sort of like guidelines and starting points. They're not prescriptions that say you must have this. <laughs> so if you want to like kind of starting point or, or reference numbers, then houseplantjournal.com or you can just Google bright and direct light requirements by plant, houseplantjournal.com link comes up, then that table will help you get started with what general light levels would I be looking for in order for pothos to grow well. If it says minimum for maintenance, 100 foot candles, then it means if you put a pothos where all day it never sees anything higher than 100 foot candles, then you can assume, okay, the plant may be just barely able to maintain itself versus when I, you know, the listing for fiddle leaf fig, I put the minimum for maintenance as 400 foot candles, which is to say, if I put a fiddle leaf where most of the day is 100 foot candles, and that's way below the 400 that I said in the table, that's why it will drop 80% of its leaves in a month. Right. And are these snapshots that you're taking? Because light obviously can fluctuate throughout the day, especially depending on your window orientation, depending on cloudy, sunny, that kind of stuff. So are you leaving that light meter near the plant for the whole day? Are you going back throughout the day to take some snapshots to get like a general sense? Like how would you suggest we get the best amount of data? That's right. So actually this works with what we talked about earlier, which is that for natural light, we're going to call it as having two states, which is from that one spot, you can either have a direct line of sight with the sun, which is going to be direct light. And you don't need to measure that. I mean, you can, it's going to be 3,000, 4,000 foot candles. But the purpose of, of knowing the direct light is you're going to use the column in the chart that says tolerance for direct sun. So for different plants, it's one to two hours, it's four hours, whatever. So what I'm saying is for direct light, the parameter that's most important to me as a houseplant owner is how long does that last? And then when the sun moves away, that's now the indirect light portion of the day. And that's where we need the light meter to then assess whether I'm, that's why I said on average, right? I, like on average, am I always below 100? Am I in the 100 to 200 range? Am I in the 200 to 400 range? Am I in the four to 800 range? What I just stated there is actually important because those are what I've kind of concluded as those are the ranges of indirect light that are correlated to the physical size of your window, basically. And that is to say, if you have exceptionally large windows, then that patch of the sky that you that that radiates onto your light meter will be in the 400 to 800 foot candle range. Versus, I'm in a small room with a small window. If I put my light meter here, the range will always be within one to 200 foot candles. And if I stand far away from my window and I take my light meter any time of the day when it's indirect light, it may never be higher than 100. And that is to tell you why my simple advice is they need to be as close to the window as possible. They need to be as close to the window as possible. But when you get a meter and you start playing around, then that's when you really can get the sense of, okay, if this is 100 near the window, like there are very few plants that can go here. No fiddly figs will thrive here. You also reminded me of the of the tolerance for light. That same fiddly fig, Figaro, who is under the Soltec light, he grew so much, he grew too tall, not too tall, but he started encroaching on too much light and he was actually getting sun stress on his top leaves, on the very top leaves. And I remember texting Leslie being like, what the hell is this? And she was like, yeah, that fiddle leaf is, is sun stressed. So there's that walking the balance between too little light and too much light. And I love this concept of you also having the humidity measurement. And I mean, it's one purchase that's going to get you so much information about your plants. 
because for me, I bought the humidity meters. I bought the light meter. I bought the temperature, obviously, but I just think it's so cool. And I'm so proud of you, my friend. I mean, that's pretty impressive. I mean, we're kind of at time, but I want to know a little bit about, I know that you've been working on this thing for years. So what did the development process look like? What were the tweaks? What are you most proud of? Tell me, give me the insight on to how you developed it. Yeah. So as with any idea, you know, you, you try and start to doodle some things on a piece of paper and draw up some designs, right? Mostly my goal was just because I would walk around a park or something, even with this thing. And my wife yeah, would say totally. to me, like, why did you bring that with you? And like, but I have, I have to know, I have to know what, how bright is shade, for example, I'm standing in the shade, how bright is it? Like, you know, I, I just wanted to measure basically wherever I went. So I wanted to make something that was compact, like as small as possible that could fit in my pocket, that would then also give me nice, clear readings. So you start with just doodling and then you engage with a, uh, a product designer. So somebody who will render things for you uh, into 3D CAD drawings and that kind of thing. That's designing like the look of it. But then of course, there's also the inside, which is the circuitry and like how the screws go together, nuts and bolts, like literally the nuts and bolts inside. Then you, for that, usually the manufacturer will, will sort of design that for you and you kind of work back and forth with them, which is how I get like, you know, prototypes made like this, testing out the functions and all that. When you get the prototype, how long did you sit with the prototype walking around the park and, you know, your house measuring everything. Like what does each phase, how long did each phase take? I think the the design phases are the longest ones. Like, so we're talking several months potentially of back and forth, right? Especially, for example, my drawing ability is obviously not the greatest. So even though I drew some concepts, once I got the renderings from the product designer, like they might go different directions and then see Mm -hmm. which one I like. So it's almost more like, like I'm not an expert chef, so I can't make the, I don't know all the ingredients that go into it, but I certainly can taste it and judge whether I like it. Right. So that's yep. sort of the journey is more like you're just tasting and see what you like. And then, yeah, so those, those parts take the longest in terms of the, the testing part. I think that part went really fast because I could effectively get, the, I, once I got the prototype, I was able to do a couple of tests and figure out that whole infrared thing. And then we just had like zoom calls. I would have zoom calls with my manufacturer and talk about all these designs and then they would change some stuff up and maybe send me another prototype. And then while that's going on, you do fancier product design for nice boxes and and packaging. You know, all these things, they they have to be thought of too. Like you can't just make a product and then just say, hey, buy it from me. Like it needs to be set up everything. Yeah, so it's... And it's very House Plant Journal brand. It's very (laughs) sleek. It's like your watering can. Sleek, I know I always say sexy, like that sexy watering (laughs) sleek design. But the packaging looks amazing and the light itself looks amazing. Thank you. Thank you. How long was the whole process from the drawing on the napkin or the drawing on the papers to getting the first packaged light for sale? I think that took about two years. Oh, my goodness. Oh, actually. Well, okay. I I think I've left out an important part of the story, which is that I actually started with a different initial design and I had it done like, you know, rendering and everything. But then once I got to the manufacturing stage, The manufacturer came back and said, if you want us to make this, it's going to cost like raw cost. It's going to cost you $200 per unit. Mm, right? And then I would have to sell it for like 400. And that doesn't make any sense. So it's like I had to do a full like redesign in order to get the cost to come down in order to make it make business sense. So that part of it probably (laughs) made the time like maybe almost double. Who knows? But uh, that's all I am. I'm including all of that in the time that it took to develop because when you get to different stages, you never know when you might hit a point where it's like, okay, we can't make this work this way. So maybe we have to go back to the drawing board, so to speak, literally, which is what I did, and redesign in order to make it work like as a viable product. That also speaks to your commitment to creating a meter for the houseplant enthusiast, right? Because That's the whole pain point is that we don't want to spend $400 on a light meter, but we want the knowledge. And so the fact that you went back to the drawing board and figured out, no, my audience needs a light that is under a hundred bucks and like affordable and easy investment. People spend $200 on a plant. It's like your light meter is $99. What are you most proud of, of the light meter? I really like that. I personally have enjoyed using it because I, I remember as I kind of foolishly mentioned that I would bring this around with me everywhere. And like, this is kind of hard to fit in your pocket, right? And if you're listening to this podcast and not watching it, Daryl's holding up this bright orange brick 
that has yes. a big wire connecting to the sensor, it would be so clunky. I don't even think I could fit it in my purse. Right. And, you know, I don't think you carry a purse. I'm sure you'd have to carry around a backpack. But I yeah, like it's hideous. <laughs> yeah. So then what I did was like, like the fact that I created designed and created this light meter that I personally really enjoy walking around using. And the whole point of like, you see this, like this convex mirror here, right? The purpose of this mirror is to give people a visual understanding of, okay, this scene right here is giving me 42 foot candles. Well, why is that? Okay. Cause I'm, you know, this distance from a window and I'm next to this light here. If I go closer and you see the number now is like 80 to 90, well, why is that? Because the physical size of this of this angle of view towards this light has gotten bigger, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why mm -hmm. I keep saying about the widest possible view of the sky is because literally when you look at this little meter here, you'll see what is my view of the sky and what is the corresponding reading of, of light, right? So when I, for example, use my phone and take a picture of what I'm measuring, then this mirror shows people, okay, I'm roughly this close to whatever window and it's producing this, the number that I see here. It's like, I think maybe just to really simplify it, it's just to say, this is where I came up with the saying, widest possible view of the sky is, is because of this. It's because you're going to get the strongest indirect light when you are closest to your window. And that the meter is going to tell you that you don't have to move that far in order for the light to drop in half. Totally. I'm just so proud of you. I'm so excited for you. This is so cool. I also just was looking at you and I was reminded about this Pokemon, Gotta Catch Em All. I remember when we met up in Canada, you took me to a couple of your favorite plant shops and I bought a Bulbasaur yes, yes. <laughs> pot. <laughs> I was just thinking that. But, you know, you're so committed to bringing the science of, you know, bringing that engineer's perspective, which is, you know, you and I are polar opposites when it comes to our <laughs> approach to plants. And I so appreciate that about our friendship is we approach things really differently because I'm total creative. Like I don't want to look at a number ever, but in terms of empowering people, sometimes you do, you need those hard numbers. And even for my creative self that doesn't want to look at a number, my first light meter, you know, I got obsessed chasing all my plants down, looking at the sun. I could see that happening for so many people in this audience. And I love that. I just saw that snapshot. You're at 67% humidity. I'm so jealous. I'm at 45 <laughs> right now. But where can people check out your light meter, your courses? Where can people get more of you? Houseplantjournal.com is my website. And is that the only place yeah. that the meter is sold? Houseplantjournal.com? Well, no, because I, I do have a few um, places that stock the light meter. There's like Botanical in Edmonton. There's Figaro's Garden in Vancouver. There's Dynasty in Toronto. And I'm honestly very sorry if I forget some of these. But like then in the States, I have a... Uh, Mull Halls in Omaha, Nebraska, and mm -hmm. also the Sill, the Sill, Big the Sill. The Sill. They have a, a good, healthy stock of light meters as well. So if you want to save a little bit on shipping, then by all means, find it at one of those places. So it's available there, or if you're elsewhere, then houseplantjournal.com. Yeah. And you've got courses and just like so many blogs. You're such a resource. You've been, you know, one of the OG plant fluencers in the space. And um, I hope it doesn't take another year to have you back on the show. And I can't wait to get my hands on the light meter and start playing around with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And I think we can do it like an interesting episode or something with light meter. Because uh, again, back to that reverse engineering thing is like, because I know that you have been successful with plants, then I am curious about what your light settings are. And I'm sure like, for example, that fiddle leaf, I'm, I'm really curious about it because the phenomenon of it burning when it's too close to the light, it's almost like inevitable because the plant is growing towards it. And as you know, with a, well, I mean, yeah, you do know with the light meter that every inch that you go closer to a grow light can change that number a lot, right? A lot, a lot, so, a lot, a lot. <laughs> yeah. I just yeah. didn't realize how quick the plant was growing. And I just like turned around and I was like, oh boy, you know, that could be a really fun episode, Daryl, for next year. Maybe we could get a little panel of people who have used your light and we could all compare and contrast measurements. We could get really into the nitty gritty of the science and the measuring. Plant friends, if you want that episode, if you want that, you know, nerdy deep dive episode, DM me, let me know. And Daryl and I can work on finding some other plant friends who have his light meter and maybe we could like really dive deep. I think that could be so nerdy and fun. Yeah. Or, or honestly, any light meter, because 
I mean, honestly, they, it, it's like I made my, my resources to be like agnostic. It doesn't have to be my light meter. And so that's the purpose of it is to like have knowledge that we can share. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you're the best. Houseplantjournal.com. Go get your meter. Go follow him. And I hope to see you much sooner than a year from now for a follow-up episode in 2024. Mm -hmm. Yes, that would be awesome. Thank you so much, Daryl, for joining me. I love Daryl. He's been on the show so many times. He's such a good plant friend. I'm so proud of him. I mean, the research and effort that went into designing this light meter, all in the effort of making light more understandable and attainable to everyone at a decent price. Dang, I paid $300 for my light meter. <laughs> Daryl's is under 100 Check the show notes in case we ever can put a discount code in there for you before you go buy one. It's linked in the show notes. Daryl is linked in the show notes. Follow him at Houseplant Journal. Check him out. Check out his courses. He's amazing. Go follow him on Instagram. I hope this episode illuminated things for you, plant bread. Let me know if you liked it. As per usual, I'm always open to suggestions. I'm currently building out my 2024 content calendar. If you have ideas for episodes, I would love to hear from you. I would love to know what you want to learn about. Let me know. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, I hope you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. 
There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. <music> 